welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lana. Um, it's a good morning uh, <laughs> from me, colleagues. Um, I'm, 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 I'm relieved to be here. And thanks so much to Lona and colleagues uh, for pulling all the stops. Uh, the unfortunate thing I'm sure colleagues uh, will agree is to speak after everybody else has spoken, more so if you have not heard what they said. <laughs> the danger is repeating what they've said or saying things that they have already proven to everybody that they are not valid. So I hope you bear with me, colleagues. Uh, the topic of my talk uh, is beyond uh, policies, uh, considering uh, bottom-up multilingual pedagogical practices in South African higher education. Um, I think uh, as uh, opening remarks, uh, colleagues will admit that a great deal of effort has been made uh, by way of language policy work uh, to address uh, the legacy of uh, hegemonic colonial and apartheid language uh, policies in South Africa. Um, we know why this had to happen. The idea has been to attain uh, social justice uh, in relation to political, economic, and social uh, opportunities that could not be enjoyed by the majority of South Africans, in part related to language policies of the day. Um, whereas uh, there's been progress, whereas we can really uh, comment uh, South Africa, especially from the policy perspective, will also admit that the implementation of the policies has been far less um, impressive owing to various challenges, uh, chief among them, uh, the lack of political will and insufficient funding that is needed to implement the policies. However, um, perhaps uh, an aspect that has not been given due attention uh, it's some bottom-up practices and initiatives and the opportunities that is bear uh, for the normalization of multilingualism, including in higher education. So we have bemoaned uh, lack of political will. We continue to bemoan and justifiably so insufficient funding, especially from government to actually um, try to deal with the issues associated with um, language. Um, I'll look at what is probably well known. South Africa is a multilingual country, just like most uh, African countries. But something that is uh, perhaps uh, interesting and commendable about South Africa is that this multilingualism is acknowledged by means of policies in other African countries uh indigenous languages are actually not uh, recognized they don't uh even appear as languages um i remember years back when i met uh, a colleague uh, from uh, the democratic republic of congo and i asked her what uh, her language was she said french and really i think um almost in the same breath as uh Oyono, those who know uh, Ferdinand Oyono, who wrote Houseboy, um, he raised an important question. Um, the question read, brothers, who are we Africans called Frenchmen? And that's what struck me when I engaged with this colleague. And I said, but you are from Congo, not from France. And then she said, oh, you are asking me about my dialect. And then she told me the dialect but the language is French. But with South Africa, at least we have an acknowledgement of linguistic diversity and the recognition of the individual uh, indigenous languages. Um, and this is again yes, the background of uh, colonial and apartheid language policies, which uh, displayed fluctuation uh, between English and Africans depending on the powers uh, of the day 
And uh, owing to that bilingual language policy, indigenous uh, African languages have historically been marginalized and uh, reflecting uh, on that uh, bilingual language policy regime, uh, Neville Alexander actually labeled it a strategy between uh, Boer and uh, Britain, uh, which is ironic, uh, especially given that uh, Mr. Boer and Mr. Britton were actually having this battle in the land uh, <coughs> of Africans where uh, they have their own languages. So, um, I would like to look at the issue of language uh, in relation to governance, is particularly in the colonial uh, and apartheid uh, setup, uh, using the lenses of um, James Tollefson uh, and um, Pen Alistair Penny Cook, who said uh, in most colonies, uh, language policies were intricately linked with issues of uh, governability. So they say, whether the language policies seem to favor African languages or seemed to uh, privilege English, uh, whatever was happening was an effort to manage uh, Africans, the colonized, to ensure that they were governable, to ensure that they remained docile uh, citizens within that setup. So, most often, we are so quick to generalize that um, uh, African languages were not promoted, but there are instances where English was not so forcefully imposed because there was caution that if you give these colonized enough English, then you will have sort of upgraded them to the state of the master. So at the end, there will be no distinction between the master and the colonized. So whatever language was meant to be given to the colonized had to be in the right dosage, in the right prescription, so that they could be uh, governed. So as a result, uh, indigenous languages were non-existent in the, were non-existent in the uh, controlling domains such as uh, government, education, and so on. But in South Africa, they had a place. And this place is the so-called, infamously uh, called Bantustans, uh, the so-called homelands. So whereas in the public formal domains, you wouldn't get, this is you wouldn't get, Sitswana, Sisutu, and so on. They were actually confined to the homelands where Africans stayed. And this aligned well uh, with the apartheid policy, which was meant to keep Africans in their places in their places also divided so that they could also not mobilize, you know, in unity to deal with the system. And uh, that sort of aligns again with what Makoni says about the development of African languages uh, by missionaries. He said, while uh, it can be appreciated as a form of the injection that uh, gave a literal boost to African languages. It said it created, you know, boxes. You know, you have this is Zulu here, you have this Tosa here, you have the here. And in some cases where the boundaries were not um, scientifically drawn between these languages and these boxes, interestingly, they also conform to the establishment of boundaries, territorial boundaries. Uh, between African countries as we have them now, or within provinces within the African states themselves. And that also seemed uh, to manifest itself to some extent uh, to the classification of the higher education system in South Africa, whereby you have white universities versus black universities. But these white universities linguistically could also be divided further into English and Africans universities. But the black universities, so to speak, were not African languages universities, they were mainly English universities. So it goes back to the point that I've just made that indigenous African languages were virtually absent from the controlling domains. It is therefore from that perspective that apart from 
the language policy work, the higher education sector itself was alive to the issue of, has always been alive to the issue of social justice, to the social justice uh, principle, given the um, alienation of, of, of the majority of the citizens from the sector. And if we go back, we will see that, for example, the National Commission for Higher Education, it was actually trying to deal with these issues of access, these issues of transforming the sector in order to expand access to the previously excluded uh, populations and also to make uh, universities uh, multicultural uh, spaces. Uh, but there's something uh, interesting uh, that uh, Alexander observes. He was actually part uh, of the National Commission for Higher Education. I think he was invited to join later on. And he states that he was invited towards the 11th hour when the commission had almost done its work and uh, to his disappointment, no attention was paid to the language question. So all the issues that seem to be problematic uh, owing to the apartheid past in relation to higher education had been considered, but nothing whatsoever about language which seems to confirm that even today, uh, the general feeling among academics is that um, English is sufficient, you know, as the language of higher education. Yet, um, there are some barriers that uh, we continue to notice. Um, and uh, it is from that perspective that, um, Whereas from the broader um, effort of transforming the higher education sector, language was not recognized from the outset. Uh, from the language uh, policy point of view and in line with the constitution which recognized uh, 11 official languages, uh, nine of which uh, being the previously uh, marginalized indigenous languages we got the language policy for higher education in 2002 and after that there was the ministerial report on the development of indigenous languages for use as uh, mediums of instruction and then um, in 2015 another report emerged uh, being produced by the ministerial advisory panel on african languages in higher education and that culminated in the language policy framework for institutions of public higher education in uh, 2020. Um, there's something uh, that I need to remark which is uh, very interesting given you know that list of uh, legislative um, efforts um, one is the formulation of institutional language policies, which was actually one of the key imperatives that cuts across all those documents that I've just referred to. They required that each university formulates a language a policy and publish it. And universities did that. And in those policies, um, a requirement was met that uh, indigenous African languages be identified by the respective institutions for development and for use as fully fleshed academic and administrative languages. And then uh, related to the language policy framework of 2020, another uh, important remark uh, is that uh, DHET has been tasked with uh, developing a funding strategy for the implementation of institutional language policies and by extension, the language policy framework and the demand that universities publish language policies and implementation plans, which need to be submitted to the head and uh, also the submission of annual reports to actually indicate the progress that uh, the universities are making. Okay, 
with all those uh, measures, uh, those imperatives in place, some of them fulfilled, um, it is notable that by 2015, when uh, the latest report of the ministerial panel was published, 23 of the 26 institutions had adopted institutional language policies. And the ones which had not done so are those that had been recently established. So we can tick a box and say universities had complied with the requirement that they develop language policies. And in those language policies, they did uh, indeed identify uh, indigenous languages that they were going to develop and use alongside English and or Afrikaans. But what is actually interesting is that um, the language question was actually uh, an integral matter in the 2015-2016 Fees Must Fall movement, so, and Roads Must Fall. So while our students uh, were raising concerns about the host uh, of matters that needed attention from a transformation imperative, language was raised. Of course, uh, this first picture is an old one, I think around 1976. But all these, um, for example, UCT uh, being accused of not uh, complying and implementing its own policies, and then um, students demanding that uh, Stellenbosch be opened, you know, for a diverse uh, population that is in direct reference to Africans being a medium. And then roads being so wide, of course, white appears are so prominent there, but under it, you can see uh, a student actually remarking that, yes, you can pronounce het, but you cannot pronounce hadebe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a concern that has been raised uh, after every edition of uh, our graduation, where students complain that um, the vice chancellor, the dean, actually butcher their names and surnames because they feel that no effort is made to actually learn our African languages. And then this one again, wrote so white, all my lecturers have been white unless we're in teaching black subjects. And those who teach black subjects, it's us. So it means the lecturers are white, English, except when they are teaching African languages. So, this is just to illustrate that our language is actually at the core of the need for transformation in South African higher education. But also an important remark uh, linked to those um, legislative pieces of, 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 uh, that I identified is the fact that by 2022, Adia was and is still working towards a funding strategy to facilitate the implementation of the language policy framework, which was due for implementation on the 1st of January, 2022. So they are still working on the funding strategy, which really is uh, quite amazing, given that uh, the policy was gazetted in 2020. And by the same government, which knew that, which actually scheduled that it should be coming to effect in 2022. And then they had to wait for the universities to start implementing before they actually start their own, um, uh, working on their own mandate of, of developing a funding strategy, right? Talking of putting a cut before, uh, a cut before the horse. And then um, by end of 2022, DHEAD was and probably still is working towards another advisory panel. I stand to be corrected on that one. Uh, maybe my colleagues are part of that panel, but I was approached and supposedly appointed, and uh, that was last year, I'm still waiting <laughs> to be told that as part of that panel, I need to do something. But what I'm highlighting here is that it is actually interesting that from 2020, the government is still trying to put in place measures that can lead to the implementation 
implementation, which is due in 2022. Okay, so um, looking, trying, uh, this was sort of to give a general context, which I think uh, speak uh, to the issues that we identify in most, if not all, uh, South African institutions. There may be some minor differences here and there, but now I'll zoom into roads, which I have a close proximity to. So Rhodes, by way of background, is a historically English university. Remember, I uh, spoke of the classification of institutions according to languages. So Rhodes, historically, is an English university located in the Eastern Cape. That is the heartland of East Tosa. So uh, that's where it is. And another important thing is that it is named after Cecil John Rhodes, um, the founding father of Rhodesia. Rhodesia was actually a country that uh, combined three modern countries now, that is Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes, in fact, I, was the all-conquering British soldier who actually aspired to paint Africa from Cape to Cairo Red that was to make Africa a British colony. So he's credited of uh, giving land to two South African institutions, that is uh, UCT and Rhodes, where questions have been asked as to where he got that land from. Um, but then moving on until uh, around 2010, the majority of students are at Rhodes identify themselves as English home language speakers. Of course, I need to draw attention, caution there, because um, according to the education system, there's something um, that is happening. I, I find it quite difficult to understand that uh, an African language speaking child can have a home language that none of her or his family members speak. It can be a home language at school. So you can have a home language that is not present at your home. So um, that self-identification of students as home language speakers of English uh, might actually yield um, slightly inaccurate uh, statistics. But interestingly, by 2020, more than 50% of the first entrance students at Rose University uh, were identifying themselves as East Tosa speaking students. So what I'm trying to show here is how um, the student body has drastically transformed uh, in these institutions, which is probably linked to the efforts of the sector, you know, starting with the work of the commission to transform uh, the institutions to open them up in terms of physical access to students who would otherwise not uh, make way to those uh, institutions. So it shows that in terms of physical access, the universities have started to diversify uh, and transform. But apart from East Tosa, um, there's also a significant presence of Isi Zulu and Chishona from Zimbabwe as some of the African languages that are spoken in the university. So demographically, uh, English is no longer a major language uh, at Rhodes University. And I'm sure uh, the trends could be similar across the other institutions. So generally, uh, South African universities are now linguistically diverse in terms of student bodies. So um, it is uh, against that background that we have to look at the university language policies and looking at the Rhodes language policy, which was first adopted in 2003, it actually identifies English as Tosa and Afrikaans as its official languages. And that remains the case even in the latest uh, version, which was revised uh, in 2019 and is currently being revised to align it with the language policy framework. Uh, what is uh, stated as important uh, in that policy are the principles of social justice, redress, equity, social 
cohesion, epistemological access, and respect for linguistic and cultural <laughs> diversity. So that's the context. That is the spirit that is supposedly guiding that policy. But when we look at the policy statement, we see, we start to see some contradictions. For example, the first bullet, um, the university's language of uh, learning and teaching is English, and the university's official uh, business is conducted in English. All right. This may start to raise questions about the parity that is supposedly professed across those languages. Uh, but when you read further, you can see that these other languages that have been identified can be used uh, subject to certain conditions where and when practicable where possible and so on. And it is uh, thanks to those uh, clauses that most of the university language policies and the constitution itself uh, has not been implemented fully when it comes to, 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 to indigenous African languages. So at the end, uh, most of the people who are in the positions of power, they will always say, it is not possible, it is not practical. And some of the reasons why it's not practical are related to funding, which um, according to uh, most uh, scholars uh, and activists involved in language issues uh, is a sign of a lack of a uh, political will. So what I have tried to show thus far is the fact that language policies uh, have been developed, so there's been sufficient language policy work, but implementation has been lacking. And this is where my argument comes in, that uh, we need to look beyond policies, beyond policy work. And in this case, I'm actually trying to encourage that we focus on what could appear to be small scale activities and initiative and see what it is that we can learn from, from them. So um, it is these uh, bottom up uh, approaches that I would like us to sort of appreciate and maybe see if we can't uh, expand on them. And in the context of roads, um, some of them are linked in particular, uh, evolving from uh, the roads uh, must fall, uh, protests, um, roads uh, held um, a transformation summit in uh, 2017 that was uh, coming from the demand from students. And from that summit, language manifested itself so strongly such that uh, the summit worked in terms of uh, uh, re reference working groups. So there was one for language, and then there were others for teaching and learning, community engagement, uh, institutional culture, and so on. Obviously, it was not surprising that uh, from the language uh, working group uh, there were issues that uh, were raised in relation to language policy and practices within the institution. But what was also remarkable was that language became prominent from many other working groups which were dealing with issues of teaching and learning, uh, issues of institutional culture, recruitment processes uh, from HR and so on. Um, it is surprising uh, in the sense that it shows that there is generally awareness and consciousness about the importance of language. But um, it is not surprising in the sense that language is omnipresent in all you know, the activities, both academic and administrative activities of a university. So there was that specific recommendation that the university should use South African languages in addition to English in teaching, learning, and research. And this course should be developed. I think that is in line with the language policy and the fact that demographically, it is the province where this is predominant. 
And then um, another recommendation was that the university should reconstruct itself as a bilingual or multilingual organization. It's Tosa and African, that is two of the official languages of the Eastern Cape, should be made more prominent in the life of the institution. This is 2017. The policy had been adopted for the first time in 2003. So it's clear that the prominence of these languages was not seen. They were not visible enough. And then another recommendation was that it's Tosa, the language of the majority of the staff in lower occupational levels, should be adopted as a second language of work at the institution that included a demand for all university communication to be made available in both English and this Tosa. And then after the summit, uh, an institutional transformational plan was developed and a recommendation was made for the university to establish a South African Indigenous Languages Center. So I consider these uh, bottom up activities because they came from students, they came from staff, including the low level uh, occupational staff, not just uh, academics. And then apart from that, I also consider um, what I call a community of multilingual practices, that is pedagogical practices that are not coming from up, but coming from low levels are uh, driven by individual agency of academics and students in tutorial groups. So I'm listing here a few examples uh, such as a multilingual pedagogic practices in initiative in economics. So that is economics in the faculty of science. And then a lecturer there recognized that there were students who were actually suffering, not because of other pedagogical issues, but also because of language issues. And then uh, in politics and international relations, uh, there's been an effort to teach and assess um, the course uh, in this Tosa and other African languages since 2017. And then the avocational specific courses such as this Tosa for journalism, this Tosa for pharmacy, and then there's this Tosa for community engagement, and then uh, translanguaging in the cell biology class, uh, Translanguage in teacher education, and then multilingualism for an African centered psychology. So these are initiatives, and then learning to act and listen through tongues. That is an initiative in the drama department. So I'm highlighting these as initiatives by colleagues who are themselves not students or academics within language studies, mm -hmm. right? But out of their consciousness and their sensitivity, they have developed those um, initiatives. And those initiatives, in fact, uh, came through. I'm not unpacking them much. Uh, we are going to host back on day in September. Some of the colleagues will actually get an opportunity to present their work, but we have actually um, been privileged to see, get an insight into this work through um, uh, a colloquium that we held last year where we invited uh, different stakeholders from the university to actually show how they were responding to the language needs of the university community. So, so it is some of those colleagues who presented that work. Um, what is actually promising, which leads me to recommend that we take note and take, uh, take these uh, activities seriously, is the fact that the language committee, which is charged with the responsibility of implementing the language uh, policy, uh, comprises of some members of the community of multilingual practices. So some of those colleagues who are driving those initiatives are actually part of the language committee and they are actually informing the language committee about their own practices, what has worked 
in their own spaces. So it is no longer a case of the committee and management coming down to the departments to say, we want you to do one, two, three. But now there is sort of um, a mutual you know, process whereby uh, there is a policy, but there are academics who are also saying this works in our fields in line with the policy. So we are actually encouraged by the fact that these practices are now influencing the language policy rather than a one way process where uh, the practices have to respond to the policy. Uh, apart from this, uh, the language committee and um, my office, my project, is actually driving the process of documenting all these language practice initiatives across the university. And we have a project that will be starting soon that is actually expanding it. It's a collaboration uh, between uh, seven universities, including UWC Northwest, I think we are here, uh, where we are trying to actually document these practices Firstly, to recognize and appreciate them, but also to learn from each other and see if we can replicate them or maybe also inform them because some of them are maybe driven by passion, but they may be lacking here and there whereby maybe from an academic or theoretical perspective, they may be enhanced. And then apart from that, uh, while we are working in response to the imperatives of the language uh, policy framework, um, we have earmarked the members of this uh, community of multilingual practice to be champions of multilingualism in their departments and faculties such that the work of implementing multilingualism in the university does not remain the sole responsibility of the language committee, but we also have uh, people who are actually doing the real work, you know, uh, driving it uh, at departmental and faculty level and reporting uh, and informing the language committee. Um, this takes me to uh, the project that has actually brought uh, most of the colleagues here together, that is uh, Bakonde. I want to show how Bakonde has actually come and dovetailed into the efforts that um, all these South African colleagues here have been driving, I think, since the dawn of, of democracy and maybe even before. Uh, what Bakonde has actually done, I think, is has been to sort of uh, provide capital, uh, at least for Rhodes University, towards the establishment of a language center. Um, I have already indicated that there was a requirement that an entity be established that is dedicated to satisfying addressing the language needs of the university community. So through the establishment of an ALDU, um, there is now a sort of a formal structure, even if it might be limited uh, in terms of its scope, which um, the university can build on. Uh, I must say that uh, even before Balkonde, there was already an effort towards the establishment of a language center at Ross University, which was unfortunately uh, put to a sudden halt by the outbreak of the pandemic uh, in 2020. So that work was put on hold, but um, uh, Bakonde has actually given more fuel to that work. I'll refer to it again later. Apart from that, uh, Bakonde has also helped us to sort of re-energize and give momentum to the community of multilingual practice that I've referred to. Um, those who have hosted, uh, that link has already hosted some of the colleagues from your Rhodes University. The initiatives that I referred to, some of them are actually driven by the colleagues who actually attended the back on the training workshop here. So those colleagues, so we did not start from scratch because there was back on there to go around saying, colleagues, this is what we can do. In fact, we had to say, 
there is now a project that can actually, you know, uh, drive, uh, take the work that we have been doing to another level. And then besides that, Makonde has actually facilitated uh, and enhanced the dissemination of the work that colleagues have been doing, uh, as I'm actually doing here. And this sort of strengthens our collaboration with partner institutions within the project and even beyond. So uh, by way of concluding remarks, I would like to indicate, as I've already alluded to, that ROADS, uh, like all the other institutions, is currently revising its uh, language policy in line with the language policy framework. And while it is doing that, uh, it is already drawn from the bottom-up uh, initiatives, uh, which actually gained uh, more voice uh, during the 2017 uh, Transformation Summit. And then the establishment of a language center um, is already a key milestone uh, in the university's institutional development plan volume two, uh, that is, uh, which is uh, valid from 2023 this year up to 2027. And the good news is that a budget, even if modest, has already been set aside uh, for 2024. And um, with a seemingly better accountability mechanism, uh, I'm saying better because so far, um, I don't think we can convincingly say it's been effective, as I indicated that the issue of funding uh, is still clouded um, in, 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 in controversy. Uh, there does seem to be a glimmer of hope, which needs to be nourished by more commitment from uh, all the institutional stakeholders. Um, it's a pity I'm not using my laptop. I had a short video that I wanted to share, which is work that has developed from back on there. Um, of course, building on the work that started uh, in 2017 uh, in the Department of Politics and International Relations, where having started by um, allowing students to write uh, small pieces of assessment in languages that they are comfortable in, uh, now course outlines and other written materials have been made available in this Tosa and Sizuru. And lately, um, students with the guidance of uh, their lecturer and in collaboration with our uh, Sachi chair have managed to produce audiovisual uh, material which can be used uh, to complement the uh, formal academic material that is given to students, like small clips that focus on key concepts and trying to explain them in the simplest possible way using indigenous uh, languages. Unfortunately, I'm not going to show that uh, as of today, but it will soon be uploaded uh, on the back on the Bologedo uh, repository uh, so that other colleagues can have access to it, uh, make use of it, and also give feedback to it because um, one thing uh, is that given that this is work that uh, was started by colleagues who are not experts in languages, definitely the work needs uh, to be improved. And uh, our approach is that we don't become prescriptive and say, uh, don't use the work until it has been perfected. But our approach is that we continue improving the resources as we use the languages. Otherwise, I end uh, my talk by thanking all of you. Yabonga, Yabulela, Nkosi, Yalibora, Donivua, Asante Sana, Taitanki, Nesibuku, Mushmas Gracias, Ho Rai. I've missed my pronunciation <laughs> that I learned today. Thank you very much, colleagues.
thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for stepping off the plane and giving such an excellent talk. Um, we have some time for questions. So if you're online and you want to type a question in the chat, we will ask it for you. If you want to shout out your question from Zoom, you can do that too. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, we have had a uh, quite an interesting uh, kind of presentation. Uh, but what I wanted to, 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 to check is that uh, you said uh, you have gone a long way in terms of uh, uh, policy structures. Uh, but at the same time, you also commented that uh, in terms of implementation of those policies, we are still lacking on that. And now what, what, what I would like to know is that uh, do you have any other way of uh, ensuring that the implement, I mean, the policies are being implemented? Because even at the end of uh, your talk, you, you, you spoke about revising those policy matters. Uh, uh, have you got any plan of implementation? Well, I think it's been more of the same uh, since the first uh, language uh, in higher education policy was uh, um, uh, uh, promulgated and then uh, responded to by different universities in terms of uh, formulation of language policies. It, it's been a cycle with uh, without much effect because um, I don't know about other universities, but if you look at our different versions of our language policy, there's not much difference. The principles are basically the same. The policy statements, they are the same. The idea is to enhance uh, access, um, epistemological access. The idea is to ensure that uh, language ceases to be an access barrier. Um, no one gets discriminated against on the basis of language. So what I've observed is that we develop these policies uh, we do very little by way of implementation until they are due um, for review. And the review, the reviews have been cosmetic in my view. And I think it's almost the same if you compare the language policy for higher education of 2002, and even the language policy framework, there's not much difference. It's clear that uh, in terms of our policy pronouncements, we know what we want, although in some cases we may uh, seem to be conservative. So we continue pronouncing new policies, even if it will be a case of new wine in all pockets. Um, or the other way around, someone has actually said South Africa uh, is a policy highway because we are always quick and ready to develop new policies, even uh, if we don't implement them. The hope is that in many cases uh, in the past, universities did develop language policies, but they did not develop implementation plans. This time around the language policy framework makes it imperative that language policies be developed together with implementation plans. That may seem um, to be positive, but again, language implementation plans alone without funding, without the needed political way may lead to the same uh, conclusion where we will find ourselves revising not only the language policies, but also the implementation plans, which might not even have been failed. So the policies have not failed us. I think we've failed to implement the policies. Thank you. That actually, if you don't mind, that leads us to a question from Pedro, which is a follow-up. And uh, Pedro, is a, you might be able to see it, Dion, behind you. In light of a multitude of bottom-up initiatives, what strategy would be most suitable for coordinating them and or giving them the visibility they deserve in order to maximize their transformative potential? 
Um, thank you, Pedro. <laughs> thank you, Pedro. I thought, okay, uh, Pedro asking that question, I think, um, is, is a sign that I failed to do what I wanted to do. The idea was to actually show that our strategy should actually coordinate and draw inspiration from these initiatives. And this is what I was trying to demonstrate that Rhodes University now is not just working from top where lang the language policy is imposed on the departments who are told what to do. But now the language committee is actually asking colleagues at the lowest levels, the departments or even um, in the institutes to say, what is it that you are doing in your corners that we need to pay attention to as we revise our policy. So I think documenting these initiatives so that we are aware of them and then reflecting on them to assess their impact, to identify where they need to be strengthened and to identify those that um, have greater potential for replication, I think that is the strategy that we should be adopting. And paying attention to these initiatives maybe will give some of us who have been working on this um, project, so to speak, for a long time, because uh, for a long time, we've been lamenting that nothing is happening, but there is a lot that is happening, only that it is happening at a small scale. It is not appreciated and it is not disseminated adequately. I hope I've answered you, Pedro. <laughs> He apologizes. He said he missed a few points. Yes. So <laughs> Prof Nubuklein will ask the next question from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you so much, Prof, for, for the presentation. That was lovely. Um, Prof, we have, we have alluded to the issue regarding the, the funding that the government is still working on the on the funding mechanism to fund the the, the, the framework, the current framework, which was uh, published in 2020. Um, I don't know if we discussed this in the previous COPOL meeting, um, where Chief Mabizela indicated that in his previous hit um, from GPT, they have already allocated some funding, but the funding is still sitting with UWC at the moment. So they have um, identified UWC to be the host institution that will come up with a um, maybe a plan in terms of how the other institutions will benefit from that point. Maybe they may be asked maybe to devise, maybe, I don't know if it is that panel, maybe where you may be requested to form parcel of the panel that will be now devising maybe the monitoring in terms of how that funding will be monitored as it will be dispersed to the different institutions. But like, I think there's a glimpse of, of hope, um, we hope that funding will be coming soon and then we, we start to increase from all these initiatives that we have indicated that like are taking place at the university and also in other universities we may then get more additional funding to assist to boost the, the, the promotion of this university. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for, for, for that. I think um, my presentation was not as negative, I'm sure, yeah. as I've been in the past. <laughs> because uh, uh, for me, what, what I think I've appreciated from the language policy framework is that um, it also places some responsibility on DHET, whereby I think uh, even, I think the last COPAL meeting that we had before Chief Mabizela, uh, moved from DHEAD. Mm. I think the message was clear from the different okay. universities that we have not implemented because we are waiting. Okay. <laughs> we are waiting for, <laughs> for our back, which will enable us to do the work. So I, I think that is helping. Whereas in the past, the accountability was one way. It was DHEAD saying, there is a language policy, what are you doing about mm. it, you know? So I think there, there, there is 
progress. Okay, well, um, I was going to say some, uh, something to, um, yes, um, the money is coming soon. Um, there are certain structures that are being put in place, and uh, uh, most likely everyone in this room is going to be party to, to those structures. Um, a DHEAD needs to formalize certain things and then we'll be notified. But what I wanted to um, say was this, uh, maybe in a big um, response to Pedro, it's important to understand the university landscape in the country to know why certain institutions go for the bottom-up approach. Um, so across the country, the traditional African-speaking universities have extremely well-developed structures for language management generally. And the reason is because um, they were under pressure. Um, I think it was even in the 2002, uh, policy that made it legal for any university in the country to deliver its curriculum only in Africans. And so um, those African speaking universities were really under pressure to, while maintaining Africans, make it possible for English to be used as well. So when <coughs> Stellenbosch or Northwest, um, they have these very developed structures around uh, managing multilingualism. In contrast, I mean, perhaps apart from UKZN, um, you know, um, most other universities, what you would find would be the individual initiative. People taking it upon themselves and say, all right, the policy has provided implementational spaces. Um, the provisions of the policy resonate with me, and I am going to do something about it. So it's interesting to see that uh, what's happening in Rhodes really mirrors quite a bit of uh, what's, what's happened at GWC. Much of what has been done has been based on you know, individual resources, uh, there's no structure as such. Um, so, but I think it also draws attention to the fact that when there's a will, there's a way. And you do not necessarily have to have millions of rands to be able to get things off the ground. In fact, now that hopefully money is coming, it will be, it will be a lot of money, <laughs> but hopefully that somebody is coming. We can now build on some of these smaller initiatives, you know, scale them up and, and perhaps uh, make much greater impact than we would have been able to make if we're starting from scratch. Uh, thanks again for sharing your uh, experiences. I have a very quick question, if I can. Um, Prof, thank you very much. You mentioned a couple of committee. Um, could you clarify a little bit, language committee? advisory panel and the language center. Language center is from Rose University, whereas advisory panel is also from the university or a larger- no, that's national. That's okay. National, yes. And the, most of the uh, specialists are um, joined, at least one of them, say academics will take part in most of the committee. Those panels. Those yes. panels. Yes. And who else are there? in those panels or language center or language committee? Well, uh, the language committee is a Senate uh, committee. Okay. So it is chaired by um, the DVC for teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And then it has representation um, of, 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 of the deans or their nominees and some strategic uh, individuals based on the work that they do. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a member of that committee because my research has to do with um, multilingualism. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be someone from education because they train teachers. So it's, it's, it's looking at uh, the people who either contribute to the development of languages or people who can be affected by language work within the university. Okay, it's university level. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the language center is meant to be sort of an operational mm. structure. Yeah. The committee mainly advises and monitors, but the language center is meant to be an entity that can get its hands dirty, so to speak, to do the actual work. I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can guess that your PhD is on language policy and higher education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a very huge supervision meeting. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, look, oh, it's been a, it's been a really great day with four excellent speakers, and our fourth and final speaker has just pulled out all the stops. So, Dan, thank you so very much for that. The talk will be recorded, like the rest, and placed online shortly. Um, thank you to all of our online audience for staying with us during the day from from Scotland. Um, hello to Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and from all the group from Spain, a group from right across South Africa. I think we have some colleagues from the Netherlands as well. So, um, to all of you, greetings from Ireland and we'll sign off now thank you very much indeed <laughs>